It, is continue, it continues to be appropriate to say Merry Christmas, for we are still in the Christmas season, the 12 days of Christmas. It will last until January 6th, when, at which point it is appropriate to take down your Christmas tree, unless it's turned into a fire hazard or otherwise just needs to come down. And at that point, uh, we celebrate Epiphany, the coming of the, the wise men, and then Mary and Joseph take a, a jaunt over to Egypt and come back, and then we celebrate Jesus' baptism. So those are the next two Sundays. But this Sunday is the Sunday in Christmas, the Sunday of the Christmas season. And uh, in this Sunday, we have this story out of Luke. It is the only story Luke gives us of Jesus' childhood. Uh, a topic, a part of Jesus' life that is much pondered and wondered and discussed, but we really don't know all that much about it. And we don't know that much about it. There are two reasons we, we, one of two reasons we don't know much about it. One is, Luke lays out the beginning of his gospel. He says, I'm going to give you, my dear Theophilus, a clean and clear account of all that you have heard. And so Theophilus is a, it translates as lover of God, and so it is a, this is going to be a clean account for anyone who loves God uh, of the stories of Jesus Christ. And has anyone ever told you a story that got so bogged down in details and all the side stuff that you just want them to get to the point? It maybe doesn't happen to you, but it does occur. Right? And so maybe uh, Luke only gives us one story because you know he's got things to talk about. He's got we got to get there. He'll tell us this, but this, let's not get bogged down in details. Maybe that's it. The other reason might be technological. Uh, a scroll is only so long. Why do we have First and Second Samuel in the Old Testament? Because they couldn't fit Samuel onto one scroll, they had to divide it into two. That, that's it, that's the reason. That's why we have First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. It had to do with how long the piece of paper was. And, and that might be it as well. It might just be a simple restriction on, I only have this much space to write. Okay, Jesus' childhood gets that much, because I got other things I got to get to. And, and, there are things that, and so there are things we'll never know. I put this in the same category as, what would have Glenn Miller done if we had a CD instead of a record? Like, Glenn Miller, when he recorded the, the records, the old, I think, believe they were the 45s, each side was three minutes long, if I remember correctly, and uh, so you could only record a three-minute song. I've always wanted to know, what would Glenn Miller do with ten minutes? Don't know. Never will. What, what else happened in Jesus' childhood? Don't know. Never will. This is what we got, and so we, we believe that what we have in the Scriptures is enough. It is sufficient for salvation, for which we are thankful. Uh, it'd be nice to have more, but this is what we have. So, what is happening here? We tend to get caught up in the point at which they lose Jesus or misplace, or lose track of however you want to tell the story. Because as a parent, that is something that is a, a little bit familiar, that sensation of, you have a child? Wait a minute, do you have a child? Do you know where your children are? It, it's, it's, yeah, it's a moment. <coughs> um, What's happening here, they're going to the religious festival, Passover, in Jerusalem, and they go every year. Not a surprise that Mary and Joseph would be very diligent in their attendance to worship. And they travel on foot from their hometown, so they get the whole large, everyone going to the Passover gets together, and chunk, 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 they travel up the hill, up the mountain to Jerusalem. The safest way to travel, big, large groups of people. And uh, we read in this that Jesus is 12. Now, when you think of a 12-year-old today, what do you think about? Like, imagine that if you know any 12-year-olds, right? When I think of a 12-year-old, I'm thinking about someone that I might consider handing a smartphone. I might not. I'll get back to you in a few years and let you know what I do with Sophia, right? I, I, I don't know. It's someone who is three to four years from, from giving the keys to a car hopefully one that you don't have too much money in, and then six years from graduating from high school. Like a 12-year-old is uh, nowhere close to marriage. Uh, the average ma marriage ma age for uh, men in, in the United States is like 28, 29. So at 12, you're not even halfway to being able to, to sort of starting a family. Um, so that's kind of where our sense of what a 12-year-old is like. 
That's not the case here in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, there are no cars. There are no, there's no formal education. It's all hands-on with your dad. And so as long as you can work with your hands, work a team to plow a field, or in Jesus' case, do what his dad does, work with wood. Can a 12-year-old do that? Can a 12-year-old work with wood? Yeah. At that point, as a 12-year-old, you're, you're about ready to be an adult. Right? The idea that there is the, the invention of the teenager um, is actually rather new. If you go back to, it's in the 1900s, early 1900s, New York, I believe it was New York, invented high school to keep what we now call teenagers out of the factories. And so the idea that, that we extended adolescence for another uh, couple years, that, that's a new idea. You go back to uh, this day, uh, 2,000 years ago, and at this point, Jesus is 12. He is one year out from being 13, and at 13 in the Jewish culture, you're an adult. That, that's it. Like you're, but the idea, you may have heard of the bar mitzvah. That practice would not be fully developed until the 13th century in France. But here is the line that's at the first bar mitzvah. Here's what the dad said to the son. You are no longer my responsibility. You ever say that to a child? Right? You are no longer my responsibility. That, that, that's adulthood, right? Uh, and that's what, that's what Jesus is about to hit. He's 12, and he's about to hit to the point where his dad will go from being responsible for him to saying, well, that is a shame, son. What are you going to do about that? And, and so it makes sense then that they've taken this uh, jaunt. Like, and, and so I imagine Jesus is more like we think of like 17-year-olds, someone who's about to graduate high school and go off to college and, and that level of sort of maturity. And so it's no surprise to me that Mary and Joseph have uh, a little bit more laid-back attitude. They, they're doing the same thing they've done every year, going to Jerusalem. And, and Jesus is about to be an adult, and, and so it, it, I can imagine the moment at which Mary and, and Joseph say to Jesus, you know when we're going to leave, same, same thing as every year, and Jesus goes, yup. And Mary and Joseph do that thing that a parent has to do at some point. They, they have to not ask the question. You get to that point where what they want to say is, are you going to be there? What are you going to do till then? Right? Do, do you have unclean underwear? All those questions you want to ask as an, a, a parent, and, and, and Jesus isn't volunteering at all, and he just leaves. And Mary and Joseph go, I hope this works out. And, and he goes off to the temple. And uh, he, he's... He's at the temple. And, and they leave. Mary and Joseph, they leave and they get a day out and, and they think Jesus is with them and they settle down for the night, put up their tent or whatever they're sleeping in and know Jesus. And so a day out and then they've got to go a day back. To, to, to get, it takes an, a day to get back and then it takes the day to find him, in the, find him in Jerusalem. So it takes them three days to misplace Jesus and they find him, which is a good thing. But uh, that, that's the three days. It's understandable. It happens. It, I'm sure every parent... At, has any parent successfully raised a child without losing that child at some point? Y'all give me a lot of hope. <laughs> Olivia and I have already lost Sophia once. We were up at Camp Jaoda and uh, Olivia came into the dining hall and, where's Sophia? I thought you had Sophia. And she was out running in the field, just running, enjoying herself, right? That's, that's what happens to Mary and Joseph. They just misplace their child. It happens. And so what does Jesus tell his parents when they show up? Why are you surprised I must be doing my father's business? Right? From the very first, Jesus is focused on his father's business. As far as I know, this is the first decision that Jesus makes. Can you think of any other moment earlier in the gospel, or any of them, at which Jesus makes a decision? Like, I, I can't. As far as I can tell, this is the first moment that we see Jesus decide something. And his decision is he is going to seek his father's focus, his father's will, his father's business. And um, maybe that's why this is, of all the stories of Jesus' childhood, maybe that's why this one gets in. Because it's important to see that from the beginning, Jesus is focused on his father's will. Of course, you've got to wonder what Joseph would say to that. We don't actually have Joseph saying anything in any of the Gospels. As far as I can tell, he is the absolutely silent dad. And uh, 
you can make the joke about not getting a word in edgewise. I, I don't know. But um, you got to wonder how that impacts their relationship. I got to do my father's business. Son, you're, I am your father, and I, my business is to get you home. You're giving your mama a heart attack. And... Um, but this brings up questions, right? What does Jesus know and when does he know it? He does, he's 12. What does he understand about who he is now? And then we read uh, as we come to the end of this passage that he goes home and he grows in wisdom and stature. And what does it mean for someone who's fully divine and fully human to grow in wisdom and, and stature? Wisdom in the Jewish culture is uh, experiential. Like, I can tell you a knife is sharp, and that's, that's data. Or I can teach you the way that a knife feels against your nail when it catches, when it's got a good edge. That's wisdom. Right? I, I'm sure that for... Uh, Jesus and, and, and Joseph, it, to grow in wisdom is, you know, feel the wood right here. This is how it feels when it is good. Here's how what it feels like when it needs to be squared. I mean, this is, can touch it, feel it, move it. This is what it feels like. So he, uh, he grows in wisdom and experience. That makes sense. He grows in stature, gets taller, and people think of him, think, think good, well of him. So that, that's a good thing. But what is it? We still don't quite know what it means for Jesus to grow. Like, what does it mean to, for uh, someone fully divine to grow? We come to the end of this, and it tells us that Mary treasured all of these things. This is not the first time that this has happened. Mary, when uh, the, the shepherds show up, Mary treasures these things in her heart. When the Magi shows up, Ma Mary treasures these things. And, and, you know, for strangers to show up and you've just had a child, like anyone want to welcome strangers into your hospital room when you've just had a child? Like for Mary to be able to treasure this, that's impressive. And, and then when the th uh, three or non-determinative, we don't actually know how many wives, men there were. When they show up and they give gifts of gold, thank you, gold, always handy, frankincense and myrrh, you use those to bury dead people. Hmm. And for Mary to be able to treasure that moment and to ponder, again, that's impressive. And, and here we are, and, and Jesus has done his, made his first decision, and he has ditched them for the temple, and it tells us that Mary treasures this moment and ponders it. You may have heard the joke, why, why do we go from Jesus at 12, the next time we hear it, it's Jesus as 30, is because Mary looks at him and says, you're grounded till you're 30. And don't you dare ask your dad for anything different. Right, that's that. Uh, she had maybe 18 years to ponder, I, I don't know. But what this story leaves us with, what it builds towards, is pondering with Mary. Like I, and I got to the end of this, working through, trying to imagine, like, what would this look like as the movie? How does this unfold? And I got to the end where it tells us that Mary treasures and ponders what's going on here. And uh, I thought... Someone's got to be able to do something with this. Like, it, there's got to be some twist or fun, some understanding, some aspect of this that brings it to life. And so I started looking at other pastors, other theologians, other commentaries, and, and going through all the resources and, and trying to find, like, what does everyone do with this passage? How do they preach this passage? And I'll tell you what I found. Everyone does about the same thing. They get to this and say, yeah, Mary pondered. It's Christmas. Time for you to ponder, too. That doesn't feel very satisfying, does it? Like, I, I can't ponder for you. I, I can ponder for myself, but I, I can't ponder and treasure for you. And, and that is kind of where we land on this, right? We're left with questions to ponder and to treasure, like to, to wonder about. When, when Every time we've ever seen, if you look at icons of Jesus, pictures of, of, of Jesus and Mary, Jesus is, uh, in like old Eastern uh, paintings, Jesus is always looks like fully aware, and he's always holding up his hand like this with his the peace symbol up. And, and he looks fully aware and you gotta wonder like was Jesus fully aware as an infant? I mean who changed Jesus' diapers? What's that that was like? How what was it like to potty train Jesus? Like th these are questions that uh, we, we're left with. Like what happens to Joseph? How did Mary ask Jesus? What did Jesus say about his, his family? What did Jesus explain? Like this this time, this moment, this Christmas the masses of Christ, the worships directed towards Christ, we have these couple days here 
where we ponder who Christ is. And we're going to hit epiphany and baptism, and, and then it's off and running because we're back to focusing on what Jesus does. But here are these 12 days to, to join with Mary to ponder and to treasure who Jesus is, the mystery of the Incarnation. And it is profoundly a mystery. I can't explain it. Right? I, I just can't. And, and so I have to... Uh, Join with Mary. Luke puts this together so it ends with Mary treasuring and pondering. And I have to believe that that's, there's a purpose there, that Luke is directing us towards that so that we might do the same, that we might join with Mary to ponder and to treasure in our hearts uh, what is happening here, that we do not fully understand. But with Mary, who's the, the first disciple, like if you think about it, Mary is the first person who says yes to Jesus. And uh, she is in the mother of the church, in a sense. And, and so to join with Mary, to be willing to say yes to Jesus, even while we ponder and treasure that which is confusing, that which we don't fully understand. And, and so this passage leaves us with these two, two things. Like Jesus from the get-go, the first decision he makes, he is focused on the will of his Father. And Mary, it leaves us with Mary, the second aspect of this passage. It leaves us with her pondering and treasuring what she does know, pondering and treasuring what she doesn't know. And I'd invite each of us to maybe spend some time this, this day and this week to ponder and to treasure what does it mean that Jesus was born and born for us. I don't understand, but I'm going to ponder it. See what we come up with. Amen.